here's everything you might have missed in Moon Knight Episode 4. Welcome back, you Marvel maniacs, to our weekly breakdown of Moon Knight. And if you're higher than my expectations for this series right now, that's good news because things took a turn for the trippy in Episode 4, The Tomb. Are you okay? Am I just... We're gonna break down all the Easter eggs and details that you might have missed in just a moment, but as always, if you prefer to read all about it, Rosie Knight has you covered over on Nerdist.com. However, to talk about this stuff in detail, obviously we gotta spoil what happens in Moon Knight Episode 4. So if you haven't seen it yet and you're worried about that sort of thing, leave now before something takes you by surprise. It's just you and me and the open road. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? Moon Knight's fourth episode serves up a heaping helping of cinematic influences running the gamut from The Mummy to One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But perhaps the biggest influence of all is Jeff Lemire and Greg Smallwood's Moon Knight comics from 2016, which directly inspired that dramatic twist in the episode's finale. The episode begins with Osiris's avatar, Salim, taking the Ushapti of Khonshu, the small stone figure in which the moon god is imprisoned, to put on a shelf with all the Ennead's other pharaoh pops. The Ennead have imprisoned quite a few gods here, and that might explain why there were far fewer than the nine gods Stephen said should be a part of the Ennead back in episode one. They've got seven gods here, and the Ennead has nine. Of course, there's always the chance they could have been victims of Gore the God Butcher, the upcoming villain of Thor Love and Thunder as well. In the comics, Gore made it his mission in life to systematically murder and enslave every god ever across time and space, and the Ennead would definitely be on his radar. But back to the matter at hand. Layla shows a flair for taking out mercenaries, and eventually she and Steven make their way to Amit's tomb. On the way there, they do what looks like the sand walk from Dune, and then we see Black Philip from The Witch, or maybe he's just related to Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder, Thor's magical goats who appeared in the Thor Love and Thunder trailer. Outside Amit's tomb, things are quiet too quiet, and the bloody knife on the ground paints a bleak picture. Despite getting shot later in the episode, Steven shoots his shot with Layla, but not before telling her the truth about why Mark is pushing her away, and about Conchu's designs on her. Mark then makes good on his threat to throw the both of them off a cliff, but sadly we don't get a protein shake recipe out of it. Oh shit! Deeper in the tomb, Steven and Layla find mummified Hekka priests, described as the sorcerers of their time. In Egyptian myth, Heka was the god of magic and medicine, but there's actually another potential connection in the Marvel comics. 2007's Mystic Arcana Magic No. 1 introduced an ancient Egyptian sorcerer named Heka Nut, who was corrupted by Kathan, the elder god and creator of chaos magic in the Marvel Universe. Given that Khonshu is retconned to be an elder god in the same vein as characters like Shuma Goroth and Kathan in the King in Black Black Knight one-shot, it stands to reason that some of these Heka priests might have practiced chaos magic as well. It would help explain why they're now murder mummies hell-bent on filling every last canopic jar in sight with sweet, sweet human organs. Now, speaking of which, we get a particularly gruesome sequence where it looks like they eviscerate Billy Fitzgerald, one of the two fake detectives working for Harrow. These Heka priests also evoke the priests of Khonshu, the beings who give Mark his powers back after he gave up the Moon Knight mantle in the Fist of Khonshu comics. As for the snake skins that Steven finds, this could be a clue to another mysterious missing god and a major Marvel villain, Seth, the shape-shifting god of war who's often referred to as the Serpent God in the comics. Specifically in the Lemire Smallwood Moon Knight comics, Amit is explicitly stated to be a servant of Seth. And while we likely won't see Seth in this show, it's nice to tease a potentially greater evil to come, especially one that's battled Moon Knight in the past. Moving on, separated from Steven, Layla fends off another Hekka priest who makes the same glottal sounds as the clickers from The Last of Us, or maybe the sister from Hereditary. <laughs> Layla then has an uncomfortable conversation with Arthur, who gets her attention by invoking her father's nickname for her, My Little Scarab. Now, if you've been watching any of our episode breakdowns, you know that we've been harping about Abdullah El Fauli's comic book alter ego of the Scarlet Scarab. With the mention of a fuchsia scarf and scarab imagery, the connection here feels undeniable. I mean, case in point, Scarlet Scarab co-creators Roy Thomas and Frank Robbins are both thanked in the credits. Now, for those who don't know, the Scarlet Scarab was a costume protector of Egypt during World War II, the alter ego of Abdul Faul, a mantle that he later passed to his son. Here, though, he's combined with Peter Alraun Sr., the archaeologist from Moon Knight's origin in the comics, just as Layla is a reimagined version of Marlene Alraun. 
Now, speaking of Moon Knight's origin story, Layla finally confronts Mark about the fact that he was, in fact, present the night of her father's murder. The show has been alluding to this the entire time and building up towards this big reveal, which is basically the plot of Moon Knight number one. Mark mentions that his partner got greedy and executed everyone at the dig site and even shot Mark as well. Mark says that he should have died that night, but he didn't. In the comics, Mark's partner was the murderous mercenary Raoul Bushman, who murdered nearly everyone at an archeological dig site, including Mark Spectre, leaving him to die in front of a statue of Khonshu. The Moon God instead chose Mark as his avatar of vengeance and brought him back to life. Marlene's father, Peter, died during that attack, but Mark saved Marlene's life and they wound up becoming lovers and partners in crime fighting. Now, with that said, it's unclear if we'll ever see Bushman in the MCU, but personally, I wouldn't hold my breath. In between Layla's confrontations with Arthur and Mark, Stephen geeks out upon realizing they've discovered the long-lost tomb of Alexander the Great. It is one of the great, pun intended, mysteries of our time, and like clockwork, there's an announcement nearly every year where some group claims to have discovered the tomb only for it to turn out to be a bust. If you ask me, it sounds like one giant pyramid scheme. I said... After giving Alexander the Great an unorthodox dental exam and finding Amit's Ushapti, Mark grabs a weapon from the former avatar of Amit's sarcophagus. While bringing an axe to a gunfight isn't the brightest idea, this particular weapon harkens back to one of the weapons of great antiquity given to Mark by the priests of Khonshu in Moon Knight Fist of Khonshu number one. Shot by Harrow multiple times, Mark falls back into the water, bleeding out. He starts sinking into golden light, fading into blackness. And while the camera flies toward a bright white light in the background, it emerges in a cheesy Indiana Jones-esque B-movie, which we learn is called Tomb Buster. It follows the adventures of the illustrious Dr. Stephen Grant and the Aztec moon god Coil Shockey. While it's not a one-to-one, -one, it does remind us a bit of the comics where Mark Spector moves to Los Angeles to become a producer and made a show based on his past called The Legend of Khonshu. That show, though, almost undoubtedly had higher production value than Tomb Buster. <laughs> And while Tomb Bustin' made us feel good for a time, unfortunately, it's nothing compared to the shock to find out that it's a movie being played in a sterile, bright white psychiatric hospital, which is full of familiar sights, sounds, and people from the series thus far. As hinted at previously, this is a direct adaptation of the Welcome to New Egypt arc, also known as the Lunatic arc from Jeff Lemire and Greg Smallwood's 2016 comic run. Those comics saw Mark Spector wake up in an asylum with no powers to speak of and a lifelong history of being in the system. The orderlies who regularly abuse him are named Bobby and Billy, like the two detective characters on the show. And just like in this episode, Mark realizes all the people in his life are actually patients and workers in the hospital. This series is obviously a massive influence on the show. Case in point, the doctor in this comic is called Emmett, but Mark believes that she's actually Amit. Lemire and Smallwood play with the character's ability to be a reliable narrator, never making it quite clear until they want to whether what he's seeing is real or just a symptom of his struggles with dissociative identity disorder. Moving on, in front of the TV, there's what appears to be a mummified rubber ducky and VHS tapes labeled in hieroglyphics. The living statue Crawley is calling out bingo numbers, which we'll get back to in just a moment. A man plays with a Rubik's Cube like Steven did in episode one. We see Bobby and Billy both working as orderlies, as well as Beck, Anton Mogart's enforcer, who Layla stabbed in episode three. He's handing out cupcakes in a throwback to episode one stolen cupcake truck. Donna, Stephen's boss from the gift shop, is a patient here clutching a stuffed scarab toy. Over her shoulder is a clock with Conchu's crescent moon staff as one of its hands. And then we see a woman hard at work on a drawing of a bird with a skeletal head like Conchu's. The art below her seems to correspond to what we see later on on the whiteboard. And last but not least, Billy wheels a sedated Mark Spector over to a corner of the room next to his goldfish, Gus, and illustrations of what appears to be the Eye of Horus or something more sinister swirling around pyramids leading toward a void. It looks like the pupils are little pyramids as well. Anyway, tell us your theories in the comments below because it doesn't look good. Anyway, Mark is clutching a Moon Knight action figure and he's tied to his wheelchair just like Stephen's bedtime restraints in episodes one and two. Layla is there too, eating the same Turkish delights as she did in the beginning of episode three, and she's also rearranging photographs similar to the postcards that Steven had in his apartment. And she's also wearing a bandage with a scarlet scarab on it. Between this and the beetle at the beginning of the episode, I'd say we're onto something, folks. And things only get weirder from here. But before we go any further, let's talk about those bingo numbers. While they seem innocuous, each one corresponds seemingly to a major issue in Moon Knight history. Be a bit happy if he pulled some 
bloody hose. B-22 is Moon Knight Volume 1, Number 22, which kicks off at the Manhattan Research Hospital, where the villain Morpheus is being held. The cover features Moon Knight facing off against his three alters, Jake, Mark, and Steven. G-15 is Moon Knight 15, an issue about our hero struggling to balance being Steven, Mark, and Jake, while worrying that he may actually be the assassin that he's hunting down. B7 is Moon Knight Volume 1, Number 7, the strangest, most chaotically terrifying night in Moon Knight's bizarre career as he loses his grasp on reality. N39 is Mark Spector Moon Knight 39, which features Donna's first appearance. I2 corresponds to Moon Knight Fist of Conchu Number 2, the first appearance of Arthur Harrow. But wait, there are even more comic references on the bingo card that Layla holds up. B-54 is Mark Spector Moon Knight 54, where Donna discovers Mark's connection to her college rival, Marlene al Raoun. Layla. I-32 is likely Werewolf by Night 32, the first appearance of Moon Knight. N-1 is Moon Knight Volume 1, number 1, the first full origin of Moon Knight. G-35 is Moon Knight Volume 135, where Stephen Grant uses a wheelchair for the better part of the issue. I-23 is likely Invaders 23, the first appearance of the Scarlet Scarab, and 29 could be West Coast Avengers 29, a Moon Knight solo issue where Khonshu speaks directly to him for the very first time. G26 is Mark Spector Moon Knight 26, where Mark's sometime lover Scarlet causes havoc for him. O89 could correspond to 1989, the year the influential Mark Spector Moon Knight series began. B38 could be Moon Knight Volume 138, the final issue of Moon Knight's first ongoing series. I13 aligns with Moon Knight Volume 8, number 13, where in an Egyptian flashback, Mark confronts his past, and in the present, Mark decides to finally confront his DID. Lastly, N86 could correspond with Patient 86, the hospital designation of the Sun King in Moon Knight 188. Okay, folks, that is quite a bit. Let's move on. The uncomfortable conversation between Dr. Harrow, the head of the hospital, and Mark is also straight out of the comics, right down to a heavily sedated Mark. Harrow's office looks like a white-painted version of his cult compound in London, and there's a painting of that German village from episode one as well. Canopic jars with the heads of gods like Anubis and Osiris are in the background, in addition to what looks like Amit's Ushapti on Harrow's desk. We also see a giant golden bust of Amit's head in the background as well. After attacking Bobby and Billy, Mark makes a break for it and comes face to face with his most prominent alter, Stephen Grant, who is trapped inside of a sarcophagus. Dressed in opposite colors, they walk past a room with another violently shaking sarcophagus, and this most likely contains another even more violent alter that was hinted at being behind those murders in episode 3. I'm talking about Jake Lockley. While Mark was a soldier of fortune, these violent outbursts are almost definitely going to be the handiwork of the Jake Lockley altar sealed away in that tomb. Of course, it's only a matter of time until Jake the taxi driver goes full taxi driver on anyone in his way. The episode ends with Mark and Steven coming face to face with the giant hippo-headed goddess of fertility, Tawerit. Hi! Remember her? Steven met her in plush form in episode one. Tawerit. The hippo. Of course, there's a chance it could be the lesser-known hippo-headed goddess Epet, who is known as the Nurse, but only time will tell. For now, it seems that since Mark and Steven are no longer sedated, they're seeing this psych ward for what it really is. A prison full of mythical creatures, just like in the comics. <laughs> Anyway, folks, there you have it. That is everything we spotted in the fourth episode of Moon Knight. We'll have even more deep dives on Nerdist in the days ahead, but for now, tell us, what did you think of this episode? Did you spot anything that we missed? I'd, I'd be thrilled. I shit myself, but I'd be thrilled. Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, stay tuned to Nerdist.com.